Our speaker today is Vint Cerf. If you go out on Wikipedia, you'll find tons of information about Vint, including all sorts of recognitions. So I thought I would mention two things that aren't on Wikipedia. First, one of the things that I've always admired about Vint, he has an incredible talent for selecting people. On the Internet Project, he picked people. And if you look at the people he picked, they all made contributions. You look back, now it's been 35 years since I met Vint, you look back and you look at the people, a really high probability of success. And believe me, from the other side, it was not apparent. People would come to us with long credentials. They'd published papers. They had gotten best paper awards. They had gotten this and that and the other thing. And Vint would say thank you. They would go on. And then he would pick up people that were, at the time, completely unknown, no background in networking. How could anybody choose someone for a project like that with no background? At the time, I looked at him and I thought, it was, I thought he was a little bit crazy. <laughs> but now, it's just amazing. The other thing I'll tell you about Vint is he is a very modest man. If there's anyone that you can point to and say, that person was the chief person responsible for the internet, it's Vint Cerf. He had the vision. He co-authored the paper. He managed the project. He selected the people. He directed the research. And more important, he pushed it through. There were lots of times when things looked like they were completely caving in, and he would find ways to either get support from whatever, the military or the telcos or the, wherever was needed. He would do that. So please welcome the perceptive in choosing people and incredibly humble Vint Cerf. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doug. I appreciate that. Well, first of all, people clap before you said anything. My first reaction is to just sit down because it won't get any better than that. But, but, uh, but thank you very much for a very kind introduction. I, I hope that I someday manage to earn all the wonderful credit you've given me. Uh, I guess I should point out something about internet. This is not something that one or two people do. It's something that lots and lots of people do. And they do it because they want to. They're motivated to do it. And, Although I worked hard to sell this idea in the early stages, uh, fairly, I learned very early on that engineering, successful engineering is not just engineering, it's learning how to sell ideas and get other people to want to participate. But somehow this idea just grabbed a lot of people. It was an opportunity to do something. There were a lot of things about this network and the way it was architected and the way the institutions associated with it grew up that invited people to contribute. It's an extremely open architecture. The uh, network working group that Steve Crocker started to do the ARPA network was one, an example of something where everyone who had anything interesting to say was free to say something. His request for comment series started out exactly that way. Anybody who had a comment was free to make one. There wasn't anybody saying, no, we won't publish that. It's not quite true today anymore because, you know, like a barnacle encrusted ship, things that uh, get bigger over time somehow get slower and more complicated. But in the early days, it really meant request for comment. So we started this network working group. We uh, mirrored that with an international network working group. The institutions that grew up around Internet, the Internet Architecture Board, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the Inter Internet Research Task Force, and so on, had a, the same character. Anyone was free to come that wanted to participate. You can't join the IETF. There isn't any membership. All you can do is show up with your ideas. And if people like your ideas, something will happen. If they don't like your ideas, nothing will happen. But the whole point was it was very bottom up, very meritorious. And it was that way in the internet environment too. So um, I think I'm really fortunate that this particular idea was so attractive that so many people decided they wanted to contribute. So I'm going to try to. Um, give you a few factoids uh, this afternoon and, and try to expose some of the issues that uh, continue to face this growing phenomenon, some of which require some serious research. And I'm hoping that uh, somehow out of this little talk, some of you may go off and solve some problems that really need attention that have not yet been solved. The, uh, the network scale is pretty interesting. There are, these are statistics that are rather out of date now, but uh, within a year or so. There are certainly at least a billion, if not more, devices that are visible on the net as, as um, servers, 
things that have domain names and generally speaking dedicated IP addresses that doesn't count the things that are episodically connected, so laptops, desktops, tablets, and mobiles, and, and other kinds of things, not counting appliances that are increasingly becoming part of the net. That probably adds another two or three billion devices. And in the uh, Farnham slide, I think the implication was that there were at least seven billion devices on the net. That was what one of the figures suggested. Uh, that's a bigger number than anything I've been uh, willing to claim. So, um, but I'm comfortable at about three. Uh, on, in terms of the number of users on the net, all, there's no one place where you have to sign up, right? So we really don't know how many people are using it. But the estimates from Internet World Stats say about 2.4 billion users uh, back in mid-year last year. My guess is that it's probably closer to 3 billion now because there are Internet cafes, there are people who share uh, equipment and the like, and you just don't quite know how, uh, how many different people are using the same uh, piece of equipment. But even at 2.4 billion, it's a pretty big number. Uh, now, one place where you and I had different statistics was on the number of mobiles in the system. It's now really estimated at 6.5, although you, your 20% estimate for uh, smartphones, I think, is, is as close as I know anyway. So that means that there's on the order of 1.2, 1.3 billion smartphones in the system that also have access to and can exercise uh, the power of the Internet. So all of that, uh, statistical information tells us that we are penetrating, but certainly uh, by no means uh, everywhere. If I had shown you this slide 10 years ago, uh, the numbers would be pretty dramatically different. North America would be at the top of the list of penetration and absolute number of users, but as you can see, that's not true anymore. The number of users in Asia is now over a billion. Half of them are in mainland China. So I want you to keep in mind that despite all the things we hear about uh, the Chinese uh, firewalls and uh, limitations and censorship and everything else, much of which is true, uh, and maybe even some of the other cyber attacks also, uh, which are probably true, there's a huge investment there in Internet. Now, I have this, you know, half, a cup is half full view about that. I think that the more Internet penetrates, the harder it is to keep people from sharing information. And eventually, the society simply has to adapt to this change in the ecosystem. So I, I hope, it's like the, uh, the Grand Canyon. You know, it probably took about 400 million years to go from a, from a mesa to this deep valley. Now, I hope it doesn't take 400 million years for the Chinese to get to the point where they're comfortable uh, with the sharing of information. But you know what? Patience counts in this, in this domain. Just get more internet out there, keep in, investing in it, and eventually, the population will change and adapt. Now, that's what the chief internet evangelist at Google always you know, preaches, and I'm preaching the same thing to you. Europe is about half a billion users, although I've given up making any projections about Europe because they keep adding countries, so the definition of Europe keeps changing. <laughs> so I don't know what Europe means anymore. North America is probably not going to get much bigger than it already is in terms of population, and we're certainly not going to try to chase you know, the other half of the world to uh, grow our own population. Which, by the way, lets me offer an aside to something that Farnham talked about, and that's the population of engineers, scientists, computer scientists, and so on, which we are, it, it, our numbers are lacking against demand. We're not necessarily going to solve the problem solely by taking the steps that Farnham mentioned, which is why uh, the whole notion of H-1B visas and the ability to let uh, talented people come into the country to participate and to help grow that uh, technology is really important. We, we need to do both. And the wonderful thing about that particular system is that the people that come in from that path almost always come in with very high credentials. And so you end up with an increasingly uh, enriched workforce. The rest of the statistics you can see here, Africa continues to be a big challenge in terms of penetration. But these numbers are a little misleading because the number of mobiles in Africa is about double uh, this number. It's around 350 to 400 million, and some number of those also are Internet-enabled. And for many of those folks, their first uh, expo exposure to Internet capability may be through a mobile, and it might even be uh, that way for quite some time to come. So uh, that's what the, uh, the penetration looks like. By the way, if you're interested in making an international business, that sits on top of the internet and uses it as an infrastructure. These numbers are important because that's where your market happens to be right now. <coughs> there are things that are happening to this net, in spite of the fact that Bob Kahn and I are going to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the design of the internet this year. We, uh, we started work in 
spring, literally 40 years ago, and finished the first design in the fall of 1973 and shared it with the International Network Working Group at the University of Sussex in England and then published a paper in May of 1974 called The Protocol for Packet Network Intercommunication. So we've celebrated, or we will celebrate 40 years of that design. The internet's been operational since January of 1983, so it's been around in some form or other in functionally for 30 years. In spite of all that age, this system is still evolving. And among the things that are changing, in uh, June of last year, those of us who were capable of serving IPv6 or delivering IPv6 capability turned it on permanently. So the, in some sense, that's the 21st century internet. You know, you guys are using the experimental internet that was designed in 1973. It, the problem is it got loose. <laughs> yeah, I thought that what was going to happen is that if it worked, that we would then build a production version. But the experimental version got out there, and IP version 4 penetrated all over a place. And then we ran out of IP version 4 address space. And, you know, uh, I, Bob Kahn and I were talking to the Princeton Club yesterday, and the question came up, you know, how come you didn't get the numbers right? And I said, well, let me explain. It's 1973, and we have just finished building out the ARPANET, which is a fairly, you know, it's fairly expensive nas national scale thing. And we thought, okay, so how many of these would you normally build in any country? And we thought, well, maybe two, because there, you know, there should be some competition. And then we said, all right, so how many countries are there? And there wasn't any Google to, answer, to ask that of. <laughs> so, so we guessed, and you know, we're computer guys, so we guessed a power of two, seven bits, 128 countries. It's probably wrong, but anyway, that's what we picked. We said, okay, so that's two times 120, that's 256 networks. And then how many hosts, you know, would be on each net? And in those years, the kind of hosts that we were using were big time shared machines that didn't get up and run around. You couldn't carry them out in your pocket or roll in, in a rolling bag. They had to be in an air conditioned room. So we thought, okay, go for broke. 16 million computers in each network, 24 bits, that's 32 bits. So we figured, you know, that ought to be good. enough for an experiment. It's 4.3 billion terminations. Well, obviously it worked okay for about 30 some odd years and then <laughs> poof. So now, if you have any opportunity to get somebody to wake up and implement IPv6, please do. Because the ISPs have been going around saying, oh, nobody's asking for it. And of course, none of the users even know what an IP protocol is. They shouldn't have to ask for it. The ISP should be saying, we'll do this under the covers. You'll never notice the difference. All the domain names will map to either one. So that's, that's what's happening now. Speaking of domain names, um, for many, many years, the domain names were all written in Latin characters only. A through Z, zero through nine, and hyphen. And then we finally realized, looking at those other statistics of where is the internet going, that there are a lot of languages that are not expressible in domain names, or in, um, in Latin characters. And we ought to allow domain names to be expressed in other scripts. So for about six or seven years, the IETF uh, went through several cycles of work. Now you can use Unicode to represent domain names. And this is a harder thing than it looks, and I won't go into all the details, but uh, there are all kinds of issues about some things look the same in one language than another, and so you could get very confused by seeing mixtures of Russian, Greek, and Latin, for example. Um, and so the computer, of course, knows the difference between all those scripts, but you can't tell visually. This is called the side of the bus problem, where you can't tell which character set some of the characters came from, so you need rules like please don't put mixed scripts into the same label in a domain name, because otherwise people will deliberately register something that will aim you in the wrong place even though you didn't know that's where you went. So anyway, that's happening though. These international domain names are part of the internet. And then uh, ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, decided that uh, we should open up the top level domain space. So <coughs> after several years of preparation for this, they uh, allowed people to apply for new top level domains. They got 2,000 registrations of which about 1,500 were unique and the others had conflicts where multiple parties asked for the same thing. So, um, oh, by the way, the fee was $185,000 per application, so $350 million showed up pretty much all in a day or two. Uh, this is, you know, that's a substantial sum of money. So now they're struggling through the, the process of, of which domain name should be allowed, which one shouldn't, and there are uh, some, some fairly serious problems with some of them. Let me give you one example. Um, in fact, I'd be interested to know, Spaff, whether you've uh, done this 
in your classes. Uh, some, one, there are two of them are dot co-op, for example, and dot home. Dot co-op and dot home, or not, not dot co-op, dot corp, dot corp and dot home are two of the recently applied for new top level domains. If you go and look in the tables of the most frequent top level domains that end up in the junk pile, that is to say they couldn't be resolved, Corp and Homer in the top 10. And the reason for this is that people, including us uh, at Google, are using .corp as part of their um, domain name system, but it's off to the left. So it's something .corp, .google, .what have you. The problem is that once .corp becomes a top level domain, it's resolvable. And now if you have a resolution system that uses what's called search terms, so that you can configure your browser, or generally you can configure uh, not even the not just the browser, but you configure uh, the underlying network structure to say if you have a partial domain name, it will add these suffixes. And so if you're part of the way through the suffix of what should resolve to something 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 dot com, but you hand the uh, partial uh, domain name to the resolver as you work your way along to finally get to the end, and in the middle something suddenly resolves because now it's a top-level domain and it wasn't before, you end up going where you're not supposed to go. And it's a conundrum. So these kinds of problems illustrate how thinking that everything is just like it was before except more is wrong. Because the expansion of the top-level domain space is into a space of functional network which has properties that the original system didn't have because originally we didn't have this kind of partial resolution and everything else. It was added as a convenience so you could just type a partial domain name and have the rest of the system figure out what you really meant. Except now it will figure out what you didn't mean. So this is a good example of, of how hard it is to get this right. <coughs> it's, a, it's all about doing system design <coughs> and, re and really paying attention to what some of the side effects could be. Uh, there are other weaknesses in the domain name system. You can poison the cache which means that somebody's gotten in, changed the content of a, of a server, and when somebody does a lookup, they go to the wrong place because the IP address has been replaced with a um, pirate host, which may have screen scraped its way into looking like it's Bank of America. You go there and you log in, leave your password, and then it says, oh, oops, small glitch, and it redirects you to the real site where you log in and do your business. Meanwhile, they're busy sucking all the uh, money out of your account. So, uh, in order to try to blunt that particular kind of attack where the server has been, uh, cache has been poisoned, DNSSEC has been developed. I, I may be preaching to the choir. How many people know what DNSSEC is? Oh, okay, fine. I won't go into details. You understand that digital signatures are, are supposed to help you there. And that is finally being deployed. The same kind of problem shows up with routing. It turns out that you can hijack internet address space by simply announcing it's yours. And you pass that information out into the routing system We'd like to be able to have the routing system recognize that somebody is hijacking space. And one way to do that is to have an announcement that you should send traffic to this IP address to me, check to see whether or not the uh, autonomous system that's making the announcement actually has that IP address space assigned to it. And if it doesn't, you reject that. And the way you do that is to have a table with digitally signed entries saying, this autonomous system has this IP address space. If somebody else is announcing it, it's the wrong uh, party and you should not pay attention to that. That's not yet implemented, but it is uh, in process of being developed. The other three bullets on this slide just have to do with what else is going on in the network environment. Sensor networks are becoming part of the uh, infrastructure, and I'll show you an example of that. The smart grid is an attempt to take electricity con consuming devices and get them to be smarter in two ways. One, please tell me how much you were used and when, so that I have some idea of why is my electric bill what it is at the end of the month. And the other one is, please pay attention when I tell you don't use electricity during the next 15 minutes because we're approaching a peak load and the prices are going to go up. And since I don't want to pay extra money if I don't need to, so the water heater doesn't have to heat water during the peak load. So the smart grid is an attempt to make smart devices feedback information to us. And you can imagine that electricity is just the beginning. You can imagine uh, a lot of other kinds of resources and appliances that consume them also providing you with feedback. If we don't get the feedback, we don't know what the consequences are of our decisions. If we get feedback, at least we have a chance of understanding how we should change our behavior. And finally, mobiles, of course, are all over everywhere. Here's some examples of devices that have shown up on the net. And I must confess to you, over a 30-year period, 
I've been a little surprised at some of the things that are actually part of the system. Things like internet-enabled refrigerators. They actually exist. They're probably a high-end thing, but they got this nice touch-sensitive panel on the front of the uh, uh, refrigerator door. This replaces the American uh, family communication system, which historically has been made up of paper and magnets that are on the front of the, <laughs> of, of the refrigerator. Now we can blog, we, uh, we can have web pages, we can send email. Um, but I got to thinking, you know, what else can you do with an internet-enabled refrigerator? I thought, well, let's see, if you had RFID tags on everything that's inside the refrigerator, it could figure out what it has inside. So while you're off at school or at work, it's surfing the net looking for recipes that it can make with what it has inside. And when you get home, you see a nice list of things you could have for dinner. So that seemed like a you know, reasonable innovation. The next obvious thing, of course, is that you're off on vacation and you get an email. It's from the refrigerator. It says the milk has been in there for three weeks and it's going <laughs> to crawl out on its own if you don't you know, do something about it. Or maybe uh, you're shopping and you get an SMS saying, don't forget the marinara sauce. I have everything else I need for spaghetti dinner tonight. Now, there is a problem. Our Japanese colleagues have invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. Now, when you step on the scale, it figures out which family member you are, sends that information to the doctor, and that becomes part of your medical record. And that seems reasonable, except for one problem. The refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> So when you get home, you know, you see diet recipes on the display. <laughs> or maybe it just refuses to open because it knows you're on a diet. <laughs> Not good. Now, there are internet-enabled uh, picture frames. I'm sure some of you have those. Uh, the way they work is that they typically download uh, images from a website somewhere that they've been uh, uh, configured to uh, access. And then they cycle through the pictures. And, uh, our family does this. We all have digital cameras, uh, mobiles and otherwise, and we upload things to that website. And then the picture frames that the family has uh, download things so we all get to see what are the nephews and the nieces and the grandchildren doing. Now, those of you who are interested in security, SPAF, um, would note that it's very important that the website that's providing those pictures be secure because otherwise the grandparents are going to see pictures of what they hope is not the grandchildren. <laughs> so now security is just as important at home as it is at work. Uh, you get things that look like telephones, but they're actually voice over IP computers. Uh, these, I think, come from Cisco. Uh, and then there's the guy in the middle with the internet-enabled surfboard. Um, he's Dutch. I haven't met him, but I have this image of him sitting on the water, waiting for the next big wave, thinking, you know, if I had a laptop in my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave. <laughs> So he puts a laptop in the surfboard, and he puts a Wi-Fi service at the rescue shack, and now he sells this as a product. So if you want to get out on the water and surf the net, there you go. And finally, I used to tell jokes about internet-enabled light bulbs. I used to say, someday every light bulb will have its own IP address. And now I can't say that anymore because somebody sent me a $20 LED IP-enabled radio, uh, uh, IPv6-enabled light bulb. And it costs $20, which sounds like a lot, except they last for 15 years, and the radio only costs 50 cents. So, I mean, in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a bad idea. So, this is a real product, and I have to find some new, uh, you know, joke material, because I can't tell jokes about that anymore. Here's the, uh, the sensor net that I was mentioning. Um, this is in my house. It's an IPv6 radio-enabled sensor net. It's a commercial product, so it's not me in the garage with a soldering gun or anything. Uh, it comes from a company called Artrock, which, which was acquired by Cisco, I guess, a couple of years ago. These little devices run on two, dry, uh, two uh, AA cells. They run for about a year. Uh, in my house, uh, each one of them is sampling the temperature, humidity, and light level in each room in the house. And every five minutes, it sends that information through a self-organized uh, radio network to a server down in the basement. So this is what, what is sometimes called, uh, it's not mobile. Uh, but sometimes you hear about MAN-A, mobile ad hoc networks. This is more like a uh, stable uh, ad hoc network. But it is dynamic because the radio connectivity changes over time, depending on what interference there might be. So these devices are essentially self-organizing. And each room in the house now is monitored. Now, I did that on purpose because at the end of a year or so, when it comes time to evaluate the air conditioning uh, and heating system and everything, I have real engineering data as opposed to anecdotal data about how well heating and ventilation and air conditioning work. Now, one room in the house is a wine cellar. And this is a very important room for me, and I want to keep it below 60 degrees Fahrenheit and above about 30 or 40 percent humidity to keep the quartz from drying out. So that room is alarmed. 
And if it, temperature goes above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I get an SMS on my mobile. And this has happened a couple of times when there's been a power failure. Uh, so um, I called the r -truck guys and they said, do you guys make actuators? And they, uh, they said yes. They said, are they strongly authenticated because there's a 15-year-old next door and I don't want him messing around with my wine cellar? And they said yes. So that's a nice little weekend project. But then I got to thinking, you know, I can actually tell if somebody's gotten into the wine cellar when I'm not there because I can see the lights have gone off and on. But I don't know what they did in there. Well, remember the refrigerator? What if I put RFID chips on each bottle? Then I can do an instantaneous inventory to see if any bottles have left the wine cellar without my permission. So I was explaining to an engineer friend of mine what a you know, bright or a design this was, and he said, there's a bug. He said, what do you mean there's a bug? He said, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. <laughs> so now we're going to have to put sensors in the corks. And as long as you do that, you might as well uh, sample the esters to see whether or not the wine is ready to drink. And before you open the wine, you interrogate the cork. And if that was the wine that got to 75 degrees, you know, when, when the cooling system went off, that's the wine you give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. <laughs> so, so this is a very practical thing to have around the house. What I do want to emphasize, though, is that this is going to be very common, that this kind of sensor system will be normally built into most new homes, partly for purposes of environmental control, partly possibly for security, and also for feedback, just to give you some sense for what's going on in the house, what uh, are the consequences of the choices that you make. Now, as I think about this large-scale number of sensors, there are some really tough problems. We are talking about billions of devices, hundreds of them in any one place. And when you start thinking about how do you manage all those things, in, uh, especially in a residential environment, I mean, it's one thing to do this in an industrial setting where you have a bunch of engineers uh, who are supposed to go off and figure out how to make this work. But if you want to make this kind of thing useful in a residential setting, you have a whole bunch of really tough problems to solve. Now, I don't have time to go through all these in detail. I wish you would look at them, though, and my slides will be available. I'm seriously interested in people's ideas about how do you architect something that, can, that will scale to billions of devices how do you keep them safe? How do you keep them from having their information polluted or having the devices that are controlled through those systems uh, controlled by somebody that you didn't authorize? So these are actually really hard problems to, uh, to figure out how to solve. And I think that they deserve a lot of attention because we could use these kinds of systems if we had them available and we had designed them adequately. Now, there's, this is just more about the kinds of problems that uh, you're likely to, uh, to encounter. And this is, I'm sure, uh, a very, very incomplete list of the kinds of questions that we should be asking ourselves. So if we really want to have uh, a large-scale environment uh, for appliances, not just sensors, and we want to have any kind of coherence where all the devices in the house can be managed by one system, or maybe, let's take an ex uh, a near-term example. If you have um, entertainment equipment, typically it, it's composed of a number of different devices, each one of which seems to have its own remote infrared control. And if you're like me, you fumble around trying to figure out which infrared control is the right one. And when you finally figure it out, that's the one with the dead battery. So, <laughs> so uh, the solution to this is to put them all on the local network, give them all IP addresses, and use your mobile as the controller and to get even more interesting, if you do this right and if you have adequate uh, authentication and control, access control, you can imagine turning to a third party to say, will you manage my entertainment equipment for me? I just want to go to the website, click on the movies I want and the music I want. You go figure out how to get it onto the various appliances and into the car and into my iPod and so on. Uh, and, and you just take care of that for me and for a small fee, you know, I will be relieved of the responsibility of trying to move things all over the place. But that requires some coherence and it requires strong authentication, and it requires uh, the ability to uh, add and remove devices from the pool in some convenient way. So this is a non-trivial kind of challenge for all of us. Here's more. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to skip through here because I don't want to beat this to death. Um, the Smart Grid, I've already mentioned, it started out as a, a project about five years ago sponsored by the Department of Commerce and the Department of Energy. And the National, uh, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology 
which is part of the Department of Commerce, organized a smart grid interoperability panel, which they've now handed off to be a private sector uh, nonprofit organization to try to establish standards for uh, appliances that consume electricity and will accept control and will accept indications, for example, that they should not use power during uh, a, uh, a peak load. Now, uh, Doug Homer and I were talking on the way up here from the airport. Apparently, these guys uh, who are doing the interoperability stuff have gotten a little overboard because the communications capacity of most of these little tiny devices is pretty small. Uh, they're using 6 Lopan and some of the other, um, or maybe even uh, Zigbee 2. Uh, and these have small packets and not a whole lot of data rate because it wasn't expected that you were going to go watch video transferred over these control systems. So uh, if you want details, you should see Doug because they need help. Uh, I think they, they have not thought their way through from a system point of view uh, exactly how to make this work. But nonetheless, the, um, no pun intended, the energy is there to try to get these devices into a state where we can manage them effectively. Uh, whereas, whereas today, you just flip switches off and on, and, and they're uh, essentially as dumb as the old telephones used to be. So there's, again, a bunch of issues there associated with that. Now, I'm, I uh, said in the title of this talk that I wanted to get into the political side of things. And so let me just tell you that now that the Internet has penetrated so deeply and is in such use, uh, uh, with such diversity, there are... Uh, countries that are beginning to be concerned about the impact of the internet on the population. They're also concerned about the impact of the internet on their own polity. Uh, we even are concerned here in the U.S. That's why you see so much legislation coming up about cybersecurity. You see issues about intellectual property protection. All of this is in great turmoil all around the world. There's an organization called the Internet Governance Forum, which was formed out of the World Summit on the Information Society starting in 2003 to 2005, and in 2006, the first IGF, Internet Governance Forum, was held. It's a multi-stakeholder organization, in some ways a lot like ICANN. So the private sector, the academic and, ec and the technical world, uh, the civil society, and governments are all participating in a discussion about I Internet issues. And these range everywhere from privacy protection to uh, crime to uh, effective use of the internet for all kinds of applications, e-commerce, education, e-government, and so on. They don't make decisions, but what they do is surface issues. And because it's not a decision-making body, it's actually valuable because you're not trying to force somebody into agreeing on the language of a communique at the end of the meeting. You're just trying to get people to be aware of what the issues are. Now, someone else is going to have to figure out how to solve some of the problems that are surfaced, and there are institutions that might be able to address some of the issues, the World Trade Organization, for example, or the World Intellectual Property Organization, among others. Or we may even have to invent some international organizations to deal, for example, with some of the cybersecurity questions that have been coming up. Unfortunately, we have uh, a, uh, an organization called the International Telecommunications Union, which started out as the International Telegraphy Union in 1865. Their job was to make sure the telegraph worked OK. And then the telephone gets invented, so they now become the International Telephony Union. And then eventually, they call themselves International Telecommunications Union. And then what happens? The telephone system starts to kind of migrate away into and, and be submerged into the internet. Because the internet doesn't care what it carries. It's just packets of bits. It's one of the interesting features of the design is that the internet doesn't know what the applications are which is great because it means if you want to invent a new application, you do something at the edge and the net hasn't got a clue. So the telephone world is suddenly confronted with voice over IP, which is free. And you know it's hard to compete with free. So they are now trying to, uh, the ITU as a governance organization is trying to find a way to take uh, more and more responsibility for internet. And some of us think that they can't even spell IP, so we think it would be better if we stay with the IETF and with some of the other institutions that have grown up around the internet in the first place. I want to uh, also draw attention to, we talked about privacy, uh, some of the things that, uh, that you mentioned earlier, Fran, uh, and many others that are on your mind, and, and the newspaper articles about information that gets lost on, on uh, laptops or information that has been stolen. Uh, by penetration. Privacy is a big problem. It's a big issue. But there's another one, and I, become, I have become um, 
I guess, a little concerned about the language around the uh, Internet and the problems that it poses. We talk about cyber crime, we talk about cyber security, and security sounds, you know, leads you towards thinking about national security, national scale attacks, responses at the national level. And the reason I uh, am uneasy about the language is that not everything that happens in the net is a crime, not everything that happens, every bad thing that happens was intentional, not everything that happens is a national scale attack. And if our only thinking is driven along that national security level thing, then the responses may be national level responses, may even be conventional responses with military weapons or maybe cyber responses. All of those things may be called for under some circumstances, but in some cases, they should, the problems that happen on the net should not trigger that kind of a response. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Pakistan, some several, couple of years ago, the Pakistani government told the internet service providers to shut down YouTube because they didn't like one of the videos on YouTube. So the Pakistani guys said, you know, saluted and they went off and uh, essentially tried to make sure that any attempt to get to YouTube from in Pakistan would be black hole. And they did this by announcing an IP address that was more precise than the normal YouTube uh, prefix. Well, the problem is that that announcement escaped out of Pakistan and got into the rest of the internet and half the world was cut off from YouTube. Now, you know, one could have interpreted this as a national level attack against, you know, a, a U.S. corporation, blah, blah, blah. Well, we talked to the guys. It was a mistake. They didn't, you know, they didn't actually do that on purpose. They just didn't realize the way they did it would have that effect. You don't want to go to DEF CON 1 over a mistake. So that's one point. The second point is that we talk about uh, infrastructure, cyber infrastructure or critical infrastructure, and immediately think of the, the power generation and distribution systems, the telecommunication systems, the water uh, systems, the transportation systems, and all of which are really important to our uh, operation. But I want you to think about the literally hundreds of millions of devices that you and I, as members of the general public, have. Now think about how dependent we are on those. We use them for our work as well as for our personal lives. If they don't work, there are lots of side effects. Okay, so now here's the scenario. A botnet has been established and it's using a lot of the machines that you and I use because we don't know that we're infected. And the infection isn't obvious. It's not like the machine suddenly slows down or a little red light is flashing saying, ah, I'm infected. It, it doesn't notice, which is a serious, that's another research problem, right? Is how, do, how come our machines can get infected without our noticing it? But let me set that aside for a moment. So there's this botnet going and it is used to launch, you know, um, an attack against a serious piece of infrastructure. Maybe it's the power generation system or a particular target or a particular company or a bank. And so now we are observing this, and we see this giant cyber attack coming, and we decide we're going to employ a cyber response. We're going to launch a, a virus back in the other direction, and we're going to infect every single one of those machines and wipe out all their hard drives. We'll show those bastards, except it's us, you know. <laughs> we're the bastards. We just don't know that because it's our machines that have been infected. The consequential side effects of that kind of response are clearly not uh, preferable, not the thing that you want. So we have, this is all about attribution. It's figuring out where did the attack come from? Who launched the attack? Are the parties who appear to be part of the attack, in fact, engaged or not? And uh, should we respond to them in the way that I was just describing? What this tells me is that we should step back from this rhetoric and think more broadly about the problem we're, we're facing I have been thinking, you know, the small business community is increasingly dependent on these computer-based tools because it gives them the ability to operate as if they were a large company. They have access to either free or very low-cost cloud-based resources. We don't want them to be accidentally damaged in a cyber response. But if they are under attack for any reason, even if it's a mistake and they don't know what to do, it's kind of like you standing in front of your house while it's on fire with a little garden hose thinking, I need somebody with a bigger hose and more water. And so you don't call the police department when your house is burning down, you call the fire department. And the job of the fire department is to put out the fire first. 
after the fire gets put out, then they go figure out where did the fire come from. If it's arson, then they turn it over to the police department. We don't have a cyber fire department. We don't have any place for you and me or small businesses to turn to when we have a problem. Some of the big companies, Google included, have whole dedicated teams of engineers to respond to these things, but the general public doesn't. So I want us to add to our vocabulary the notion of cyber safety and to incorporate into our thinking tools that will allow us to create a safer internet by making, helping all of us behave in a much safer way. For example, too many people use passwords that are reusable because the systems that have been built have been built that way. Well, a lot of people still use password as their password because it's easy to remember. <laughs> of course, everybody else knows that too. So I'm a big fan of strong authentication, of using uh, you know, uh, public key cryptography and other kinds of techniques in order to strongly authenticate parties on either end of the, uh, uh, of the communication. Digital signatures is a, another, it's a wonderful uh, technology. The question is, what does it mean legally? So here's another example where we need policy to decide if I digitally sign a contract, let's say maybe Farn Farnham and I have just agreed a contract, that's an NSF contract, and we both signed it digitally, and then I fail to produce, and Farnham says, well, I have to do something about this. And the question is, you know, in which jurisdiction does he now prosecute to say this guy didn't fulfill his, his end of the bargain? And, and, and you get told, well, I'm sorry, that's a digital signature. And you say, yes. And you say, well, it doesn't have the same weight as a wet signature does. What do you mean it doesn't have the same weight? The problem here, and worse, what if I'm not in the same country? I mean, let's imagine that there's some international arrangement, which you get into too. So the problem here is how do we establish legal regimes in which these digital things are equally strong in, in the legal sense as the conventional things that we've used in the past? Um, we heard a little bit from Fran, uh, actually a fair amount from Fran, about the intellectual property problem, so I don't want to beat this to death, but uh, it is a huge problem. If you think a little bit about how the World Wide Web works, it's a giant copying machine, right? What does a browser do? The browser goes and does a resolution, goes to a website, and it transfers the home page file, it copies the file, and then it interprets it. It's a giant copying machine, and if you're somebody who depends on keeping people from copying your digital information, the web is, you know, the enemy. And yet it is this most wonderful publishing mechanism for distributing content. It's inexpensive and it's fast. So we have this terrible collision of an old environment that depended on preventing people from making physical copies of things, and a new environment where all those things are manifest in digital form. And we have to do something about that. The something that we need to do is not PIPA and SOPA and things like that. And the reason is that some of those propositions, even though they were undoubtedly well intended, if they were implemented, had all kinds of really bad side effects, including blowing up DNSSEC, which was completely unacceptable. So some of us, staff included, made some pretty noise, loud noises about, don't do that. Please step back and let's talk rationally about what can and can't be done but let's not destroy everything. Now, uh, Fran talked a lot about preservation of digital information. I've been using this term digital vellum to mean an environment in which digital information is preserved. And here's the reason. Um, I can recall doing something uh, foolish. I was talking to some librarians about digital technology and I was all excited about it. And I came trotting in with my CD that had you know, seven billion bytes of information on it. And uh, I'm gassing away on this subject. And one of the librarians uh, excused herself, went into the stacks, and came back with a 1,000-year-old vellum manuscript, which she put on the table and opened up. It's beautifully illustrated, you know, just illuminated manuscript. And if you can still read Greek, you know, you could actually understand it. And uh, then she turned to me and said, and how long will this thing last? And uh, I said, well, I'm not so sure, actually. <laughs> And then, and then you know, she didn't quite go to the next step, but somebody, some you know, engineer in the audience uh, did me in and said, even if that you know, CD lasts, the reader for it may not be around when you want to read it. And he said, well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. We have these wonderful technologies of high density and everything else. The trouble is that we have problems preserving their readability simply because the devices that read them uh, don't stay maintained. 
I mean, I still have some five and a quarter inch floppy disks and three and a half inch floppy disks and one eight inch long disk, which is, you know, museum piece. Now, my problem here is not the issue of preserving the bits. The problem is, what do the bits mean? This is a whole other problem, and it's a really tough one. Let's imagine for a minute, you and I create content all the time using applications that produce complex files, whether it's a, a text document or a display of some sort, or maybe it's a game, maybe it's a simulation, maybe it's a really complicated uh, file, which when interpreted produces some real interesting interactive depth of analysis of, uh, of uh, let's say, reactor data. The problem now is, if I want that data to be interpretable, I have to maintain the software that knows what it means. And that software may run on a specific set of operating systems. So you can see the you know, shifting sands here. What if the next version of the application doesn't know how to interpret the bits that were previously produced by the earlier version? And the company that makes that software will say, well, we couldn't justify backward compatibility forever. And you, know, you think, well, several bad words because you had all this investment in stuff. Or maybe the next version of the operating system doesn't support that particular version of the application package. And when you say um, uh, to the person, uh, the company that makes the application, well, are you going to upgrade it so it runs on the new operating system? They say, no, we're going to sunset the product. More bad words. And then you say, well, can I have the source code? And they say, no, because the next version, half of that version uses the source code from the previous one, and I'm not going to give it all away to you. There are a whole series of scenarios. What if they go out of business? Is there an escrow that keeps the executables around? Is there another escrow agreement that keeps the source code around? We don't have a regime right now that protects your investment and my investment in content that we produce with these various applications. And even if it's open source software, there's no guarantee it will continue to be compilable on every operating system that exists from now until 3,000 years from now. In fact, here's the scenario. It's the year 3,000 and you've just done a Google search, and you've turned up a 1997 PowerPoint file. Let's imagine you're running Windows 3000. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it, it does it know how to interpret a thousand-year-old PowerPoint file? And the answer is no. And it, this is not a gratuitous dig in Microsoft. Uh, they've already done it. I have a 2010, uh, or 11, I think, um, PowerPoint package on my Macintosh, and I tried to pull up a 1997 PowerPoint file, and it said, what's this? And I said, it's a PowerPoint file, you blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's already happened. And I think we are in for a lot of trouble, not only on the research side, which Fran so clearly uh, enunciated, but just generally, a lot of stuff that we produce in digital form is going to be lost. Now, I had one kid, and this same, same kid that caused me trouble before and with the librarians, said, this isn't a problem. What do you mean it isn't a problem? But, well, you know, anything that's important will be transferred into new formats and you know, it'll be preserved. And if it isn't important, nobody will care anyway. It took half an hour to get the librarians off the ceiling <laughs> because they said, pardon me, but sometimes you don't know if something is important for 100 or 200 years. So if we don't find a way to preserve this information, the people in the 22nd century are not going to know a thing about us because all of our information is increasingly in some digital form or other. Wow, what a long rant. OK. Um, and because of the uh, time here, I am not going to go through all of this. But I want to pick up a couple of things here because uh, uh, these are problems you can work on. Um, OpenFlow is just something I want to draw your attention to. It's a, a development that came out of Stanford in the last few years. Uh, it's an extension of what we would normally think of as routing. Normally what routing does is look at a packet, look at the address, uh, addresses in the packet and say, where is this supposed to go? And then looks up in a table and says, I'll send it to whatever you know, is available to get to that destination, or I'll throw it away if there isn't any path. But what if you didn't just take the bits out of the address field? What if you could take the bits out of any place in the packet? What if you could take things out of just the content of the packet, and not the address at all? What if people announced not their addresses, but their interests? What if they said, I'm interested in this kind of information, so please put me in the routing table, and if any information of that kind shows up, route it to me? Well, there are actually some experiments that are, are being pursued with content-based uh, routing, something that Van Jacobson uh, had been exploring along with others. I think uh, Deborah, actually, Deborah Estrin, uh, who was speaking this morning, has also experimented with that idea. So OpenFlow codifies that and creates 
hardware that will allow it to happen very quickly. So it's actually worth looking at because it's a remarkable uh, expansion of the normal concept of routing. Um, I, I just let me let me move over here to hardware and software for just a second. Back in the '60s, uh, there was a project at MIT called Project Mac, and it was about multi-access computing. And in fact, Unix came out as a result of a kind of a counter. You know, instead of multi-access, how about one machine, one engineer, and you know, so that worked too. Anyway, the Project Mac machine was a Honeywell GE635 modified to become a Honeywell GE645. And the modification was uh, virtual memory and eight rings of control. And the control was tied to uh, instruction execution. So you weren't allowed to execute certain privileged instructions unless you were in the right ring of control. And if you tried to execute one, you'd be trapped down into a little kernel that would say, what the hell are you doing here? Uh, why, you know, why are you trying to execute this instruction, which is a very privileged instruction, and it writes all over the operating system? And you say, well, you know, because so-and-so uh, -so gave me permission to do that. And if it validated your permission, you would get into the right ring of control to execute that instruction. Now, guess what? The x86 chips actually have those capabilities, but nobody's exercising them. So why don't we go back to thinking about hardware reinforced security, where the software and the hardware works together to produce a more secure architecture. So that's what some of the trusted computing module ideas are um, pursuing, and that's something I want to encourage you to look at as well. Um, paranoid browsers. OK, well, actually, this is pretty important. Browsers of the day um, have a problem, because when Tim Berners-Lee did his first browsers back in uh, like 1991, the only thing that they ever saw on the downloaded file was imagery, formatting information, and text. And so that wasn't terribly pernicious, right? You could download that file, interpret it, and render it, and that was fine. But now, fast forward to 2013. What is it that you download with the uh, browser? Well, you download a file that has HTML, XML, images, uh, video, audio, and executable code, or at least interpretable code, JavaScript, Java, Python, and some other high-level languages, Ruby on Rails, PHP, mumble mumble. The problem here is that the browser doesn't know if that software is, in fact, dangerous. It can't tell. There's a Turing halting problem hiding in there if you haven't already encountered that. You can try, and we do at Google. We actually try. When we uh, index the World Wide Web and we look at every single web page, our software looks at the web pages and tries to figure out, does that web page have malware on board? And if it does, we make a little notation in our index. And if somebody uses the uh, search engine and happens to click on a, on a um, branch that would go to that infected web page, we pop up a big bright red page saying, we don't think you should go there because there may be malware on that site. Of course, we don't always get that exactly right. Now, the, the problem here is that uh, it's impossible to tell for sure that, uh, that, that, uh, that the malware exists. But at the very least, we should be making the browsers increasingly paranoid about the software that they interpret in order to protect us from that. So sandboxing and things of that kind are really important. I've been trying to get the guys making the um, Android operating system to rename it Paranoid, so that then, <laughs> but the marketing guys say it's a really bad idea. So. Um, I'm going to skip over this part. I apologize for this, but it's the only way to get through the part I really want. Um, how much time do I have left? I mean, five minutes or something? And then there's Q&A, right? Uh, OK. Well, let me try to summarize this. Something funny happens when you go from the atoms world to the bits world. The economics of the system change. So the cost of creating paper, if you're in the publishing business, printing paper and distributing it has cost. Creating bits and distributing bits has cost too, but the costs are dramatically different. And when you change the economics of an industry in a dramatic way, the business models that used to sustain the industry stop working. In the newspaper publishing business, we can see this. It's not just the fault of the internet. It's also the fact that you and I tend to look for news in a different way than we used to 20 years ago. If you look at the subscription rate of newspapers, it's been going down for a long time, well before the advent of the World Wide Web in the 90s. But it is going down. And the problem here is that their advertising revenue model, which worked beautifully for a very long time, an incredibly powerful industry, 
stop working. They used to have the cheapest way of distributing a large amount of information to everybody on a regular basis. It was called a newspaper. And because people were interested in the news, they would read it. And if they were going to read it, then they could also see advertisements, which you could sell. And that created a perfectly good business model. Now, Google invented a different business model. It said, if you're going to go search for something, or you're going to look at a web page, then we can show you ads. And if we can figure out an ad that you might be interested in better than a fixed ad that everybody sees, that might be good. And then we let people bid on getting the ads up on the various pages. That's produced a pretty good business model. Everybody tells me they never click on any of the ads. Nobody clicks on the ads except that we just generated $50 billion worth of business last year. So there must be something going on. That is a, that's a good business model, but it's different from the one that drove journalism. The reason I, I um, feel so strongly about this is that journalism is actually, good journalism is important to democracies. It is part of the whole transparency system. We have to find a way to reinvigorate and support good quality journalism. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, maybe Google should buy the New York Times or something. But, but the fact is that we need to find a way to fix this problem by helping the journalists find their way to a successful business model. Because without good quality journalism, we don't have the kind of democracy that we should have. Uh, the, the same thing, uh, let's talk about MOOCs for a second. That's the world's worst acronym. Uh, massive op online open courses. courses. Um, I was talking to uh, John Hennessy, the president of Stanford University, who is a big fan of MOOCs. Now, you, your first reaction is, are you crazy? I mean, hand away all this stuff for free? And you know, what does it do to the business model at Stanford, let alone Purdue? Well, here's the answer, or an answer. And it might be wrong, but here's, here's the way I'm looking at it. Let me see. I got 160,000 people in the class. If they each pay $10, that's $1.6 million. And that means that I can generate a lot of revenue from people that take the class, and it doesn't cost them very much, which means a whole lot more people are exposed to good quality content. Well, we'll pretend that the lectures are good and so on. Um, <laughs> I mean, not like this one. So, uh, so let's imagine now, not only do we have the possibility of, uh, of extracting larger amount of revenue for a class to a much broader audience, but now the actual footprint of people interested in taking the classes gets bigger too. What if you're at work? If you're in, in computer science business or electrical engineering or anything that's high tech, what you learned as you graduated has a half-life that's not very many years long. If you don't continually renew your knowledge, uh, you end up like a college professor teaching the same class over and over again for 50 years. And that's not valuable to an industry which is changing every single day. So that means you have to keep refreshing. That means that you're going to be interested in taking a MOOC type course because you can take it whenever you want to, whenever it's convenient, as opposed to showing up in a residential setting and, and being there for a week or two weeks or you know, four years. So I have this sense that the MOOC idea, which is now enabled by the penetration of internet, is going to open up education to a much larger audience than it had before in a much more effective way. Now, some of you who've been around for a while will remember that there was sunrise semester on television. You know, and you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and try to take notes from this you know, crappy TV uh, show with the lecturer who you couldn't ask questions of. I think we have something a little better now in the MOOC structure. And I believe that there will be business models that allow it to work. But everybody, including Purdue, is going to have to figure out how to make that work. OK, so let's, uh, let me, s this is the last bit. Uh, and I figure I should give you an update on where we are on this. Now, the first time I started talking about the interplanetary extension of the internet was 1997. And people told me privately later they thought I had, you know, gone over the top. <laughs> and, you know, obviously, you know, something, reading too much science fiction or something. Uh, actually, what I was thinking then was, let's see, Bob and I started working on the internet in 1973. It's now 1997. That's almost 25 years later. And I was asking myself, what should we be doing in 1997 that we will need 25 years from now? And after thrashing around for a little while, I thought, well, you know, we're trying to explore the solar system. And we're sending spacecraft out, you know, to Mars in particular. Uh, remember in 1997, the Pathfinder was the first successful landing on Mars since the previous few many years back. And so I was thinking along those lines. And the result was, uh, why don't we figure out if it's possible to allow a 
an interplanetary internet to grow in the same organic way that this terrestrial internet did. So my colleagues and I at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory got together thinking, well, this shouldn't be too hard. TCP IP works okay on Earth. It ought to work on Mars. <coughs> so, you know, what's the problem? And actually, that, that was a reasonable proposition, but there was this other little problem. The first thing is that the speed of light is too slow. And if we go from Earth to Mars when we're closest together in our orbits, it's 35 million miles. That's three and a half minutes one way at the speed of light, seven minutes round trip time. But, of course, we're moving in our orbits, so the distance between the two planets is actually varying as a function of time, which means the delay is varying as a function of time, and the delay gets to 20 minutes one way and 40 minutes round trip. TCP IP didn't get designed for a 40 minute round trip time, you know. <laughs> The flow control in particular is, you know, doesn't work too well because it was designed to say, roughly speaking, I've run out of room, stop. And if the other guy hears you in a few hundred milliseconds, that works okay, you know, I have some buffer available. But if it's uh, 40 minutes before, you, you know, 20 minutes before he even hears it and 40 minutes before the effect shows up, the packets are flying at full speed and they're falling on the ground and it doesn't work. There's another problem, not just the variable delay. It's called celestial motion, the other kind of celestial motion. The planets are rotating. And we haven't figured out how to stop that either. <laughs> so if there's something on the surface of a planet that you're talking to, like that little pathfinder, the planet rotates and you can't talk to it until it gets back around again. The same problem with the orbiters. So we have disruption. So here we are looking at a variably delayed and disrupted environment, which is very different from the internet of today. So we decided, OK, we have to develop a suite of protocols that can handle that. We call them the bundle protocols. We're not very good about names. I mean, if we'd done Kentucky Fried Chicken, it would have been called Hot Dead Birds. So, <laughs> so anyway, the bundle protocol is sort of the interplanetary equivalent of IP layer of protocol. We, uh, we've gone through four iterations of design. We actually have this stuff running. It's running on the space station. It's running in the orbiters on Mars. It's running on the rovers on Mars, including the Mars Science Laboratory. And it's running on a spacecraft called uh, epoxy, which is rendezvoused with two comets. It's in orbit around the sun. So it's starting. It's being standardized by the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which is made up of all of the countries that are spacefaring, including ESA and NASA and JAXA and Japan and the Russians and the Chinese. So what we are uh, anticipating is that there will be standardization of these protocols among all the spacefaring nations. Here's what we hope will happen. We hope that people who launch these spacecraft will either use the protocols in the primary mission of the spacecraft or, at the very least, be capable of running the protocols after that spacecraft has completed its primary mission and can be converted into a relay in a store and forward network. So uh, what we are Im imagining is that as these new spacecraft get launched over time to, diff to do different missions, that they can be repurposed to grow this interplanetary backbone to support both manned and robotic space exploration. Now, you might think that you know, that's uh, ambitious enough. And over time, during the 20, 21st century, uh, we will see this happen. But uh, this is what we hope will happen, that we eventually will see a growing uh, interplanetary backbone. But now there's another rationale for doing this. DARPA let a contract last year to a consortium to examine the design of a spacecraft that could get to the nearest star in 100 elapsed years. That's 4.4 light years away, Alpha Centauri. Now, right now, we have a little problem because the current propulsion system would take us 65,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri, which is six times longer than our whole civilization has ever been around. So yeah, that's a little long even for a DARPA experiment. <laughs> so, so, so the first problem is what kind of propulsion can you uh, find that will reduce that time to 100 years? In fact, what you really want is 50 years to midway so that you can slow down, because otherwise you get one picture, you know, and that's it. And so you, you need to be able to slow down to get into orbit at the other end. So we think that probably some form of uh, high-power nuclear, nuclear-powered ion engine may turn out to be enough to get up to 20 percent the speed of light. Yeah, that's all still being examined. But then there's another problem, is navigation. You know, normally when we do navigation in the solar system, you launch a spacecraft and somewhere partway through, you send a signal to do mid-course corrections if, it, if are, they are necessary. But now I want you to imagine the spacecraft is a light year away, OK? And so you want to tell it to change its course. So you send a signal. It takes a year to get there. It takes another year to find out what happened. And so you know this is not really very interactive at all. Fortunately, 
Uh, we know a lot about the proper motion of the stars that are within about 10 light years of our solar system, and so we could actually imagine doing the navigation autonomously. As long as you have stars that are farther away that don't move much, you can use them as uh, a way of deciding where you are and how, how far off course are you to get to Alpha Centauri. So the navigation problem is probably solvable autonomously. Then there's this other little problem. And how the hell do you generate a signal from four light years away that you can actually detect? So, I mean, short of, you know, nuclear explosions. So right now, uh, and also just think you have to get the spacecraft there so you can't have a heck of a lot of mass to do it. So one of the possibilities is to use femtosecond lasers. And the idea here would be to take 100 watts of power and compress that to 10 to the minus 15 seconds, which gives you a very, very big spike. And that could be transmitted back in the direction of the solar system. Now, there is a problem because even a collimated laser is going to spread over that distance. And over four light years, the beam is probably as wide as the solar system. Now you know why I need the interplanetary backbone, because I need to build a synthetic aperture receiver that can detect and integrate the signal coming from the spacecraft at Alpha Centauri. But one of the guys on the project said, wait a minute, here's another idea. What's your idea? And he says, well, you know how gravity bends light? Yeah. And he said, well, if you get 550 astronomical units away from the sun, you are just at the beginning of the focal point of the gravity lens of the sun. So if we could get a spacecraft out to the right place, 550 AU or more away, we could collimate the beam coming back and, and use that as a way of uh, detecting the signal. <coughs> so that's the up-to-the-date interstellar mission. We're still far away from um, uh, J.C.R. Licklider's original vision in 1962 when he sent a memo out to his friends saying, I want to talk to you about the intergalactic network. That's going to be somebody else's problem. So that's the end of my story. Happy to do Q&A, but thank you for allowing me to celebrate the 50th anniversary. Okay, we've got questions. Dennis. You should talk to Doug Comer over there. Right? I have all sorts of opinions about how it should have been done differently. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I would like to know if you, being a person who does know about the technology, have ever thought, if I had to do over again, would I have done something differently, and what would it be? What would it be? So repeat yes. The question. Repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, the question is, uh, you idiot, what would you have done different now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm at an... <laughs> what? What would, what would I have done differently if I would known better? Um, I, let me give you a cheap shot answer, two, two cheap shot answers. One, I would have paid more attention to security. And second, I would have put in 128-bit address. Now, <laughs> in fact, in, in all honesty, both of those things were considered. In 1977, as we are approaching the fourth iteration of the internet uh, protocol design, the question came up, should we have 32 bits 128 bits or variable length. And Danny Cohen was pushing really hard for variable length addresses. The programmers said, ah, what a dumb idea. We'll waste all these cycles trying to find the fields in the packet because of the variable length of the address field. And so we threw that away. Um, be, remember, computers of the time, even in 1977, were just a little slower than they are today. So, um, so we stuck with fixed length addresses. And then came this question, should we do 32 bits or 128? Now, this is a network which hasn't even been turned on other than in a very experimental form. And I thought, OK, let me do the math. Uh, to the 128 is 3.4 times 10 to the 38. Uh, that's a number only the Congress can appreciate. <laughs> and, 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 and then I thought, my god, you know, that means every electron in the universe could have its own web page. That's an anachronism, obviously. <laughs> So it, I, oh, and the other problem is that during that time period, we were doing Echoplex with 10x machines and, you know, TOPS 20 machines. That means every packet carried one byte of information and everything else was header. And so I thought, holy crap, if I put 128 bits times two source destination addresses in the packets, uh, the overhead would be crazy. It doesn't pass the red face test, right? So we said, we're not doing that. Besides, it's an experiment. And, you know, if it works, then we'll go do the production version. <laughs> so. We're doing the production version now with 128 bits of address space. On the security side, um, I actually was very, very sensitive to the fact that this was a military, a project sponsored by the military. 
And so we absolutely knew that if they used this technology, it would have to be secured. So in 1975, literally two years from the beginning of this experiment, I started working with the National Security Agency on the design of a secured internet. And we developed packet cryptography. We developed a whole bunch of other things. There was only one little problem. It was all classified. And the result was that I couldn't say anything to my colleagues who were part of the, you know, the network working group, worse, the international network working group, which included people from Europe and Asia and everything else, couldn't say a word about what that design looked like. And so it, the, thing, the thing just took off before there, there was, oh, here's the, here's the other irony in all this. 1977 is the year that um, uh, with Diffie, and I'm sorry, who is this? Uh, Marty, Marty, Hel uh, Marty Hellman. Whit Diffie and Marty Hellman published the first paper about public key cryptography in 1977, just as we are about to standardize everything. And they didn't have anything working. They just had this incredible idea that the mathematics could work. So by the time anything comes out of RSA and everything else, we're already standardized and well on our way to implementation. So we didn't get to use that either, although if it had been invented in time, it would have been, and if it had been made public, then it could have been used to solve a lot of uh, problems. But that doesn't mean, interestingly enough, that we can't retrofit some of these ideas into the existing net. NSF sponsored the Future Internet Design Project, FIND, and there were a number of clean sheet ideas that came out of that. In fact, the, um, uh, the, the uh, open flow ideas that came out of Stanford were part of that uh, Future Internet Project. So, I uh, am very excited about looking at what's come out of the future internet design ideas, see how much of it could be retrofitted into the system. Some people will say, oh my God, you could never redo this. Well, let me remind you that in 1973, there was one worldwide network called the Telephone Network. And, and at that time, if somebody had said, we're going to redo the Telephone Network, people would say, you're crazy, you can't do that. Well, guess what? The Telephone Network is about to be redone by internet. Maybe something else will come along that's better than internet. Maybe one of you will invent that. That would be cool. Okay, next question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I noticed this is being recorded. Will it be available on the internet so that my daughter who lives in Seattle can watch it? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it's up to, uh, the, I'm, I'm happy that there's nothing in here that, uh, that, that's a problem. Oh, thank you. So you're welcome to, uh, yeah, to put it up. Um, okay, so that's it. If she wanted to know if it was gonna be recorded and available, and it will be. So, um, what else? Two in the back, okay. What do we got? So, I'm uh, doing this in case I have to. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Relax. I, I may have to lip read, so yeah, go ahead. Um, do you think that the internet will be uh, controlled too much on our life? Uh, imagine if um, someday everything in my house is controlled by the internet. Right. Let's say, um, the government wants to control the um, the range of people. So, but, um, let's say many of the people are overrated. So, let's say um, on one day I have to, I, I want to exceed the, uh, the refrigerator refills. <laughs> yeah, right, yes. And the refrigerator so says you can't. And, and I call, um, call the people and it's, it's on the internet. So Right. And then, and then I, I walk to the pizza's um, store, but the door is not reach me. <laughs> right. Because your, your IP address doesn't work. <laughs> so so th this is basically the nightmare scenario. Uh, I have a homework assignment for you to read. <laughs> Seriously. There's a, a story by a man named E.M. Forster, written around 1906. It's called The Machine Stops. And it's about a society in which a machine takes care of them. They live at home. They're fed automatically and could be, you know, not fed automatically. And the machine breaks one day and it doesn't start up again. And the question is, what happens to that society? Now, you're describing the other scenario where the machine keeps working and, it's, and, and it, is, it is not under your control. You are under its control. And the question is, will, uh, will the Internet ever get to that point? I hope not. I hope not. Um, on the other hand, 
you raise a pretty interesting point. I mean, let, setting aside the extreme cases that you were describing, we are very, very dependent now on our mobiles for finding, you know, uh, finding, getting information or finding our way around navigating and so on, communicating with our friends. And one does wonder what happens to a society that becomes very, very dependent on these kinds of technologies. And I, have a, I share a certain uneasiness with you. But uh, Doug and I were chatting about this topic in the car. And one observation I would make is that if you were to go back about 10,000 years and ask yourself about uh, our society, it was very agrarian. It, it was, we, we were just beginning to invent the notion of agriculture, which caused us to stay in one place rather than being nomadic. And remember, wheel, fire, bows and arrows, spears, uh, you know, choppers. I mean, technology has been the story of our species and our society, and it's been increasing over time. We haven't collapsed as a result of that, although you can imagine the debates. Um, the storyteller in the village discovers somebody has invented writing and is really upset about this because now nobody will remember anything. They'll just write it down, and, his, and he'll be out of a job. You know. You can, you can imagine some of these extreme scenarios and the worries that people have. We haven't destroyed ourselves yet, but you know we probably have the capability to do it. And if you're worried about global warming, which is a whole other rant, uh, we may be on the way to doing exactly that. So that's more scary to me than the network problem that you were describing. But it underscores, your question underscores why we need to be aware of the risks and why we each need to be articulate to other people, especially legislators, about some of these risks. Because if they don't understand how this stuff works, they're going to make laws that don't make any sense. You know, they already do that in other domains. <laughs> but, but in this one in particular, it uh, could be very harmful. So I think I, I, your point is well taken, but it's up to us to make sure that scenario doesn't happen. So Doug, I think we're way over time, aren't we? So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you.